I checked for you. Yeah, it's not All right, folks, if everybody's ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Brian Arizumi. I'm the public safety supervisor for the city of Temple City. Okay, so um, tonight we're going to be talking about public safety, and you can see it's uh, that's play it safe. And so we're going to go into a little bit about um, what public safety entails in the city. Um, First, we'll start off with what is public safety? Uh, public safety is the prevention and protection from events that could endanger safety and the well being of the general public. Um, who do we protect? We protect the residents, business owners, and we also want to protect the quality of life, keeping that safe community feel that we have here in Temple City. Uh, we are ranked the fifth safest city in, in California, so that's something that we all should be proud of. Um, what do we want to prevent? We want to prevent crime and as much as we can, do what we can to uh, prevent emergencies. Um, disasters can't be prevented, but we can prepare for those as well. Public safety in Temple City consists of, one, the law enforcement, which is provided by the Alley County Sheriff's Department. Our, our fire services is provided by Alley County Fire. And emergency preparedness is uh, one of the programs that we have here in the city. It is our CERT program, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on, on that a little bit later. Uh, for law enforcement, uh, some of the topics that we're going to cover today are what are the Sheriff's Department service levels? What are the recent crime trends? What are the regional issues facing the city? And what can you as residents do to help? Uh, the Sheriff's Department, uh, our contract with them, they have two major components under the contract. One is the basic service uh, or patrol. Those are the deputies that you see driving around the street responding to calls for service. So if someone breaks into your car, uh, they'll go out and take the report. If someone has a traffic collision, so there are the deputies that would be out there taking the report. Uh, in the city, we have uh, three shifts for the Sheriff's Department. There's an early morning shift, a day shift, and a night shift. On the early morning shift, we have two units that are deployed in the city. One is a crime car, and one is a traffic car. On the day shift, we have three units, uh, one traffic car and two prime cars, so those are the ones that will handle the burglaries. And then in the evening or in the night shift, we have three units as well, one traffic car and two prime cars. Just because they're designated as a prime car or a traffic car doesn't mean that they do the function of the other units. See, so if the traffic unit is tied up on a major collision, the prime cars are capable of handling other incidents or enforcing the traffic law. So if someone runs a red light in front of them, they will issue a citation for speeding, running a red light, running a stop sign, no seat belt on your cell phone, whatever the case may be. Likewise, if the crime cars are tied up, maybe they're in the station booking someone into jail, the traffic car can handle those reports. And so they will try and minimize the response time by uh, making sure that we do have someone to provide that service to you. And again, the basic patrol, sir, they handle calls, um, emergency and routine, and they also, again, issue the traffic citation and handle the preliminary investigations. The second part of our contract is supplementary service. So the basic level of service is always going to be there. That's not going to change. That is the bare minimum that the city will have uh, deployed in the city. The supplementary service is our special assignment team. Uh, some of you may know this, uh, the special assign assignment team deputies. Uh, if you've been to a neighborhood watch meeting, those are some of our uh, team deputies. They handle community concerns, so if you have an issue with your neighbor down the street that's always throwing a party, being loud, and having um, a lot of stuff going on, the patrol deputies will go out there, but they can only handle that incident at that one time. The special assignment deputies can dedicate a little bit more time and spend that one-on-one -on -one trying to resolve those issues so that instead of just a service call coming out and telling you to shut it off and leave, they can work to do a long-term solution to that problem by working with you and your neighbor. Uh, they also assist station detectives by uh, handling the more detailed investigations. Uh, again, the patrol deputies do the basic information, basic investigation. Uh, the deputies will assist the detective bureau in doing some follow-up, whether it's going to another city and following up on additional leads. Now, some of the recent crime trends that we have here in the city um, residential burglaries are currently up. Um, we don't know why that is, but that's not only in Temple City. It's, it's a regional issue. There are other cities, uh, not only surrounding Temple City, but other areas also have an increase in burglary. 
Uh, being holiday season, uh, something else that's been coming up uh, a lot more is package and parcel tests. Who knows what that is? And for those of you who don't, that's basically you have UPS or FedEx or some courier service that delivers a package to your house. Um, you're at work or you're away uh, from home, no one's there. And UPS or FedEx will leave that package on your front porch. You come home, there's no package there. What happens is someone came behind that delivery and took that package and left. And so you're contacting your um, person that you bought it from, whether it's Amazon, saying, where's my package? They show delivered, and now it's gone. And so that is something that is, um, has increased slightly. And so that's something that, especially in the holiday season, where people are going to be receiving and sending gifts uh, to be uh, aware of. <coughs> also, another thing during the holiday season, um, any time in general, is vehicle burglaries. Um, women leaving their purses on their front seat, on the floorboard, um, people leaving their cell phones, GPS units in plain view, keys, money, anything that's left in plain view is going to attract attention. Yes? Yeah, are these uh, incidents by areas like more pronounced in certain areas than in others? We do have a uh, a prime analyst at the station that does look at some of them and try and track the trends on where it occurs. Um, right now, if it's not in any particular area, it, it is citywide, and like I said, some of the burglary issues, it is a, uh, a larger regional issue. It's not just affecting Temple City. It could be in Beverly Hills, San Marino, Arcadia as well. But what percentages are here in the city? What percent? What percent? We, I do have a slide that'll show some of the statistics. Um, that will go into as far as how many crimes that we have here in Temple City that we're tracking as part one crimes and we'll explain what that is. Um, but back to the vehicle burglaries and so you don't want to leave anything in plain sight. If it's in plain sight, me as a burglar, if I'm walking by, I see a purse on a front seat, it takes me all but a few seconds to smash that window, grab that purse and I'm gone. Um, and you come out and you don't know what happens. Uh, one thing during the holiday seasons is if you're going to the mall and you're going shopping store to store, you don't want to go out from your car or from the mall to your car, put your recent purchases in the car and then go back in. If you do that, there are people in the parking lot that are watching you and they know that all they do is smash the window, open the trunk, they've got brand new whatever it is. They don't care what it is, it's brand new. And they can either sell it or re-gift it. And so be, be aware of your surroundings when you're doing something like that. Yes? What about putting them in the trunk? No. And it, if you walk to your car carrying two armloads of packages, and I'm sitting down in the corner watching for someone, you put it in the trunk. I see you putting it in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Most cars nowadays have that trunk release on the inside. So all I have to do is smash the window, open the door, pop the trunk, and I have your purchases. And so be, be aware of that. If it's something that you have to do, um, you could probably put them in your car and maybe drive to the other side of the mall so it looks like that you left and they're not going to follow you around. So that's something that you can do to try and prevent that. Uh, these are crime statistics that we have. These are what uh, the Sheriff's Department reports as part one crimes. Those are the major crimes, the uh, burglaries, the petty thefts, grand thefts, vehicle thefts, um, robberies, and, and stuff like that. And so you can see that we have the First column is a homicide, robbery, assault, residential burglary, commercial burglary, vehicle burglary, grand theft, petty theft, and auto theft. And so you can see our residential burglaries are, are again, rather high. Um, I'll show you, this is same period last year. And so as I toggle back and forth between the two, um, or if you look at your presentation, if it's legible, you'll see that the burglaries last year were at 73 for the same time period. This year we're at 111. So, so these statistics are for Temple City? This is Temple City only. And so, yes? Do you make an analysis of why it basically uh, increased, let's say, by half? Almost? We don't. The Sheriff's Department does. Um, some of the thinking is that because of the California Prison Realignment, or AB 109, uh, where the California State Prison had to release a bunch of the prisoners, and because of the overcrowding in the um, county jails, that they're not serving the full time. Someone that gets arrested and is sentenced to a year may serve 20 days, and then they're out on the street. 
So for them, going to jail for a little bit is a cost of doing business. They, they can benefit more by committing those crimes and then <coughs> they get caught. They know they're not going to spend a lot of time in jail. They'll come out and just keep repeating. Um, so th those are, and if you want to go into more details, we can provide you that information. Uh, we do have the weekly crime report that is released, uh, that's put together by the Sheriff's Department and released by the city. And so if you're interested in that, please let me know. We can send you up for that. What steps uh, are you taking now to, to uh, mitigate the situation? In other words, kind of bring it down where it was. There are several things that our Sheriff's Department is doing with the city. Um, some of it is having the community get involved, and, and we're jumping a little bit ahead of, of here. So I'm not going to go too much detail into how you guys can get involved. There's, there's a slide, a couple slides that will talk about that. But some of the things that the Sheriff's Department is doing is they have um, additional units that may come into the city for one day, and, and they saturate the area. So as I said, our deployment level for day shift is three units. But if we do a saturation control operation, we may get eight additional units to come into the city for that day. And so you may, every corner that you turn, you may see a black and white. Uh, some of the other things they do is they go out in undercover vehicles um, and do surveillance operations. They look at the statistics and talk to the crime analysts and see what areas have been hit more or where they think that a, uh, another crime may occur. And they'll sit and watch. And they will call into black and white and say, you know what, this guy over here looks kind of funny. I'm not sure what he's doing. Can you guys come and contact him so they don't blow their cover and they can continue monitoring them? And so there are other things that the sheriff's department tries to do proactively, but a lot of what we need from you is your involvement in that. Um, these are the arrest stats for the current year. Um, you can see we have 140 uh, felony arrests for the year and 451 misdemeanor arrests. Misdemeanor arrests are anything from petty theft to vandalism. Felonies could be for narcotics violations or uh, burglaries and such, robberies. Uh, and these are these stats from the previous year. Uh, the numbers not being as high as they are, we can say that we're doing a job in either trying to lower the crime rate and, and less people are committing some of those crimes, like, uh, although the burglaries are up, um, but they do actively um, patrol and make contact and try and arrest anybody for whatever violation that they can find to arrest the people that are out there not being, uh, that are doing harm to the society. Uh, again, some of the regional issues that have been facing the city, uh, and again, not only Temple City, this is throughout Alley County, other counties as well. Um, if you read the city manager's report, you see that we've had a few marijuana grow houses that were discovered here in the city that the Sheriff's Department has search, uh, search, search warrants on. and so. That's something that is there. If you drive by the house, you wouldn't see uh, the house looking any different than your neighbor's house that, or your house that you're living in. From the front, it looks business as usual. But once you get inside, um, they tear up those houses. And again, California prison realignment. That is the uh, prisoners being released. And so it's been two years that that has been enacted and there are still repercussions coming from it. We have our deputies that are out there arrest this person one day, five days later, he's out on the streets again. And so it, it gets a little difficult, so that's something that we have to face. Uh, they also assist with uh, probation and parole compliance uh, because there's not enough probation officers that can monitor the number of people that were released from the California State Prisons to the county. How can I help? And this is where um, we're going to go into Neighborhood Watch. Lucy here is a, a big advocate and of some of you already signed up for Neighborhood Watch. Uh, Temple City has developed a, a very strong Neighborhood Watch program. Uh, beginning in January, we'll be going into our third year of the program. And our program is unique than what other cities have. We divided our city into previously 12 areas, but that was restructured to have 10 areas. When we had the individual neighborhood meetings, you would maybe have three, four people uh, involved in those meetings at someone's house. So you won't have a big turnout with those meetings. When we divide it into 10 areas, our, our attendance at those meetings is, is very high. We average anywhere from 70 to 100 people per meeting. That may sound like a lot, but when we have 800 households in an area, it's still a small percentage, but we want to increase that attendance at those meetings. Next year, we, we will be holding one meeting uh, each month for the year. 
and that is why we divide it to 10 areas from January through October. Because of the holidays, we don't host meetings in November and December because we know that attendance will probably be low. Uh, one of the other things that we changed with the area of meetings is the meeting month corresponds with your area. And so if you live in area four, your meetings will be held in April. If you live in area 10, it'll be October. This way, you know, you have an idea of what month it's gonna be held in, and then year by year, will identify what those dates depending on availability of facilities. And then the discussion is related to law enforcement and city issues, whether it's emergency preparedness, burglaries, identity thefts, parcel thefts, traffic issues. And so we do have an agenda that we do follow. Um, and if you want to get involved, Lucy is a good person to talk to to be involved in as an area leader or even a, a block captain. And one of the things that we do um, strongly believe that we have a big attendance is is because the city does provide free childcare and dinner. And so we understand that uh, the meetings are held in the evenings, you're getting off of work, picking up the kids from school, uh, you want to get home, cook dinner, or get them homework, get the homework done. And so it's either going to be go home and take care of the kids or come to the meeting. And most people take care of their kids and make sure that they're fed and have everything done for school. But if we provide childcare and dinner, that takes some of that burden off the families that they can know that the children are gonna be fed and washed and still get that information and be involved with the community. This is a map of our areas. Um, this is next year's meeting schedule. So we do have all of the meetings scheduled and we'll be updating our website to spe specify more of the areas. This map is available online as well on the city's website. And so if you're interested in knowing what area you live in and what your meeting is and where it's going to be located, uh, that map will tell you where that is. Fire department. Uh, the fire department, our services are provided by Alley County Fire Department. Uh, with the fire department, we don't have one station uh, that serves the city. We do have one station in the city, but depending on what part of the city you live in, there's four different stations that serve the city. We have station 47, which is in Temple City. If you live in the northwest part of town, you may say station five. If you live in the southwestern part of town, you'll see station 42, which is out of Rosemead. Uh, station five is in the county area up by the boat. And then uh, if you live in the southeast portion, you'll see station one, you see the 167 or 166, which is coming from Almaty. And so it's not only the Temple City Station that's going to serve so you may see other engines or paramedics um, in the area. You may even see a paramedic from South Amani come up here just because they're limited in where they strategically place those paramedic squads. Uh, the city, we don't have direct oversight uh, over fire as we do with the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department, we contract with them directly. The Fire Department, we do not. Uh, fire services are paid through a, spa a special tax assessment as part of your property tax bill. Emergency preparedness. This is a, a good portion of what we want you involved. This is a, a big effort that the city is pushing to be prepared by um, city standards, state standards, uh, federal standards, and having you uh, be involved in that as well and being prepared. What is emergency preparedness? How is the city prepared? How the city and the community can work together to prepare? and what you guys can do to prepare yourselves and your family. Uh, emergency preparedness is ensuring that an organization or person has complied with, has complied with preventative measures to contain the effects of a disaster situation. Uh, basically, it's preparing for some type of disaster and doing what you can to mitigate or eliminate those hazards so that when something does happen, the effect won't be as disastrous as it could be if you took care of some of those issues. Um, emergency preparedness, again, is a ongoing continuous cycle. Uh, you have the event, and what happens? We respond. Once that response goes into recovery, and once we recover, we're figuring out ways to prevent a future disaster, and we're mitigating it, and then we're doing additional stuff to prepare. So once we're prepared, then we're going to respond again. So it's a continuous cycle uh, for emergency preparedness. How is the city prepared? Well, one is the room that you guys are in right now. This used to be office space over here in the community, in the Civic Center. 
um, but because of the current EOC that we had uh, is not ADA accessible and we wanted something a little bit more functional, uh, the City Council approved funding to renovate the Council Chamber as well as this portion of the building. So this room that you're in right now is our new Emergency Operations Center. This is where if a disaster happens or an incident happens that we need um, response from the Sheriff's Department, Fire Department, School District, uh, outside resources, public works, it'll all be coordinated from in here. We'll have, um, we're still we're fitting, um, furnishing the facility still, but we'll have TVs mounted on the wall, we'll have boards that have maps and assignments, we'll have a projector screen, we'll have desks with computers, conference table, and so if something happens, everybody's in one room that we don't have to run down and try and find everybody to get that done. They all respond here and staff trains um, to fill those assignments. A disaster may run for 72 hours, it may run for eight hours, it can run for three weeks. And so we need to be able to do it. I can't fill a spot for 24 hours. I can go 24 hours, but going any more than that, then I'm going to start to get tired and I may not make sound decisions. Same thing with the city manager. Um, he is in charge of the city, but he can't be here if the disaster is over the course of 72 hours, there's no way that he's gonna be up 72 hours to take care of that. So we need to make sure we have other staff in place to be able to function and make those decisions as well. And that comes with training. The other thing that we have here is our backup generator. Um, some of you may saw it's that green big box outside. That provides power to this building and City Hall. So if power goes out like it did in the windstorm, we have backup power that we can still function and operate and be able to serve the community and make sure that you guys are taken care of. Uh, we have an emergency operations plan that is approved by the state of California, which is the California Office of Emergency Services, and the federal government, which is FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. In addition to that, we have a multi-hazard mitigation plan that is currently approved by the state, we, uh, waiting for approval from FEMA. What that does is identifies hazards that we have in Temple City and ways that we're going to look to mitigate it, whether it's through the planning process. And so if someone's going to build a new house or new development, the planning department's going to make sure that their plans are going to mitigate any disasters if they're in a liquefaction zone or if they're in a flood inundation zone. They're going to know what type of improvements they have to do to try and mitigate destruction and disaster from something happening. We have an American Red Cross approved emergency shelter at Live Oak Park Community Center. Um, that doesn't mean that just because a disaster happens or something that everybody evacuates there. That just means that the Red Cross and the City of Temple City have an agreement that if they do need to act <coughs> activate a shelter, that facility has been inspected by them and can serve their needs and the city and the Red Cross will work together to provide services in that facility. And again, we have ongoing training for management staff and frontline staff. Training, training, training. Things are always changing. You don't use it, you lose it. So we want to make sure that we are prepared so that if something happens, we're not having a thing that, okay, what do I do next? We want to train so that it's second nature, that we know just how we can respond and, and get stuff done and move into the next phase. Um, one other thing that we have here is the Temple City Emergency Preparedness Working Group. That is a group and we try and meet quarterly that has a lot of the players in Temple City. We have the city that's involved, the Sheriff's Department, the Fire Department, Temple City School District. Uh, we also work closely with some of the other cities such as City of Rosemead, the American Red Cross, and Temple City has a clergy group that meets uh, quarterly, and it's all the church congregations in the city that meet to discuss issues that are serving the citywide and how they can help. And so what we do is we get together so that if a disaster happens, we're not sitting here and saying, okay, well, I wonder what Temple City Unified School District's doing in this disaster and trying to figure out, okay, what's their plan if this happens? What's the Sheriff's Department plan? We don't want to find out at the time that the disaster happens that, oh, this is how they're going to respond. Because if they respond different than what we assumed that they were going to respond, it's going to throw everything um, out, out of whack and it's not going to be good. It's going to delay response, it's going to delay resources, and it's going to just be a, a bad issue. 
Um, so what we do is we meet together to understand how each entity or each organization is going to respond and work so that we can kind of fix things so that as we respond it becomes one cohesive unit that if the school district responds and they know that we're responding this way they can either follow us and do what we do as well or they can provide additional resources because they know how we function and operate. Some of these pictures, especially the one on the top left, you may remember what that's from. Who saw that? Yeah. <laughs> the windstorm that we had in 2011, November 30th, December 1st. The one on the right is a house that's been demolished in some earthquake. Um, one of the things that I, I talked with the neighborhood watch meeting is that house on the right, who would go into the house to search for victims? Now, now let me switch it up a little bit. You're walking by the house, you think, wow, that's pretty destroyed. So I don't want to go in there, don't know if it's safe. But you hear this little voice saying, help me, help me. There's a four-year-old girl stuck in there. Now who's going to go in there? What's the difference? You know something is human nature. Okay. But one of the things that we don't want to do is put yourself in a situation that you're going to become an additional victim. If that house is structurally unsound and unsafe, you go in there, instead of having one casualty, now we may have two, three, or four, depending on how many people just rush in there. And so what you want to do is make sure that you're taking the emotion out of it, and sometimes it may sound mean or heartless, but there, there's a lot of stuff when it comes to disasters that you've got to do what you need to do to take care of one yourself, your family, and, and try to do the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. And that's one of the concepts that we have about CERT. CERT is the Community Emergency Response Team, and it trains residents in disaster preparedness, hazards, and basic response skills. And so in, in this class, we'll tell you why it's not safe for you to run into that house and what the reasons are. But we'll also tell you what you can do to help and wait for and pass the information on for the fire department or those specialized units that have the tools and equipment that can enter that and, and be safer than you just running in. It is a 20 hours of instruction and training and it covers nine modules. The training is provided by a city. Uh, we do have our own staff that is, are trained as certain instructors. Uh, we also partner with the sheriff's department and the fire department to provide that training. And then once you complete that training, Temple City has a program that we've established is a CERT call-out team. So once you're done with that basic training, you can continue your training and service with the city. The basic training, if you take the training and you're taking care of your family and your friends, great. That's one less person that the city has to worry about because we know that you're going to be taken care of because you're already taking that initiative to prepare yourself. But if you want to take it a step further and do a little bit more, um, we would talk about the call-out team. The CERT curriculum, again, it covers nine modules. We teach emergency preparedness or disaster preparedness, disaster fire suppression and utility controls. Who here knows where their electrical meter is? Who knows how to turn it off? Who knows where your gas meter is? Who knows how to turn it off? Do you want to turn it off if we have an earthquake? Yes. No. No. Let's say if you turn it off, do you know how to turn it back on and turn on all your appliances safely? Who, who would come out to turn on your gas if you turned everything off? The gas company. They're not a they're a big organization, but they're not that big. Temple City, we have approximately, let's say, 10,000 households. If everybody in Temple City turned off their gas after an earthquake, the gas company's got to go to those 10,000 households and turn it on. So you may be three months without gas and heat and hot water because you turned it off. The only time that you want to turn it off is if you smell gas or you know that there, there's a leak and then you would turn it off. Uh, otherwise, if it's not leaking, leave it off. Um, medical operations one and two. This is not a first aid class. This is triaging. This is basically going through and again, you have to determine how you're going to be a service to more people than a single victim. 
light search and rescue operations, and again, teaching you basic operations on how to do a search and rescue operation with what you have, which is basically yourself. You don't have the equipment that the California Task Force or FEMA has to, with the cameras and the, the um, shims and the airbags to get into that tight space safely. So it's gonna be teaching you what you can do with yourself. Disaster psychology, there is um, victims remorse, there is survivors remorse. So there are a lot of emotions that come with the disaster, whether you're involved in it, whether you're a rescuer, if you're constantly going in and you're seeing child after child after child, it's gonna take a toll and do a number on you. So we'll teach you basically um, in a short stance how to prepare for that and, and understand it. Uh, and then if you need additional stuff, you can go to psychologists and other resources that are available for that. CERT ICS, CERT ICS, thank you. Let me see. Uh, disaster, the CERT team organization. The way the city functions, um, and actually all of the state of California and now in the, in the nation, is under a standardized system. California in 1996 developed a standard called SIMS. It's a standardized emergency management system. And that was developed because there was a fire up north uh, in Northern California that resources from California and in the southern portion went up to fight a fire at a senator's house. The fire department got there and they had plenty of trucks, but the equipment and the connections didn't match. So the fire hoses and the fire trucks couldn't connect to the fire hydrants up in Northern California. And likewise, if they came down here, they wouldn't work. And so one of the things that they wanted to do was make sure that everything was standardized. So if someone from San Diego needs to go to Sacramento, the equipment's the same and they know that they can provide that service. That was taken further to the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, uh, on a state, on a national level. And that came about because of Hurricane Katrina. And then uh, ICS is the Incident Command System. And that's basically a hierarchy that we have within the organization. It's not everybody doing whatever they want. You have one person in charge, and you have a few people under him that are in charge of additional people. So it's a chain of command that we follow to make sure that information is free flowing up and down. Um, terrorism and CERT, uh, it is unfortunately uh, a reality that there's terrorism, homegrown and international terrorists, and so that's something as a CERT person, if you're responding to disaster, you've got to have some basic understanding of that. And the last module is going to be a, a course review, and we have a disaster simulation that you take everything that you learned in the previous days and, and put that to use. Yes? What is the length of the uh, curriculum? 20 hours. Uh, we do have different ways that the class is taught depending on what city or what organization you go to. Some cities do it over a course of seven Wednesday evenings, three hours a night. Some do it every um, Saturday for three Saturdays in a row. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing, and I'll provide you that information as well, is we're going to hold a one weekend class, a Friday night, Saturday, Sunday class, so that we're going to try and get it out of the way. That's something new that we're doing, and it's because we have staff that has been trained uh, to teach the class that are able to do that. Pictures here, these are some of our previous CERT graduates. Um, again, teaching fire suppression. Clues here has never used a fire extinguisher. You think the best time to learn to use that is when your kitchen's on fire, <laughs> and when you had a fire computer in the closet or in the hallway, you grab it, you're sitting there reading it, trying to figure out how to use it. As the fire is getting bigger and you finally pull it out, now the kitchen's fully engulfed. That's, that's not the time that you want to learn to use it. So you want to learn how to use that before and understand it, even if it's one time, to understand the concepts and the mechanism of the fire extinguisher. Um, and we also learn cribbing. Cribbing is basically you're lifting up a large, heavy object using fulcrums and leverage to lift a thousand pound brick slab that's on a body so you're not trying to lift it yourself that you can't physically do. Um, the Temple City CERT call out team. And so like I said, if you once you graduate from the CERT class, you have the training. If you choose to use it by yourself or your family, great. But we want to also try and have more involvement from the community versus just the city. Temple City, we have 33, 34 full-time employees and about maybe 40, 50 part-time for a community of 36,000. 
So we're not going to be able to be everywhere all the time, especially in a disaster. Every resources are going to be very limited, and what we can do is going to be um, slow because of lack of resources. So that's where we look to the community to assist us in being additional resources out there. Uh, once you graduate from the basic cert class, you can fill out an application. You'll go through a background check, and you'll be live scanned and go through a medical um, screening. The reason for that is because of our partnership with the American Red Cross and information and duties that you'll be working, there's some sensitive information, there's some requirements that some of our partnering agencies have because you're dealing with children or anything that you do need to be live scanned to be able to assist with those organizations. And so <coughs> we up front have you background checked to make sure that you comply with our other organization's requirements. Um, you'll be sworn in as a volunteer disaster service worker, city staff, once we become employed with the city, we are sworn in as disaster service workers. We are mandated to respond to a disaster. That doesn't mean that as soon as it happens, everybody's running over here. Again, we want to, what we're teaching you is take care of your family, make sure they're done, they're taken care of and they're good. And once they're safe, then we respond. And so that's what we want to teach the community as well. Start is to take care of you and your family first, your neighborhood, then if you want to become an asset to the city, then you respond to assist the city in response to the disaster. And coming to the CERT call-out team, there's going to be additional training. Uh, we may train you in traffic control or diversion. Uh, the Emergency Operations Center, like I said, city manager, myself, city staff, we can't be here for 72 hours, 96 hours. We're going to need help. And so there are positions that it does have to be city staff in, but there are other positions that we can have community members assist us. The other thing too is just because you're a volunteer doesn't mean that you may have information or uh, experience that may be beneficial because of your professional career. So we want to tap into that and utilize your professional experience and certifications if you have any. Um, and also, again, the Red Cross has a shelter operation. The Red Cross, if we have a large disaster, uh, an earthquake in Southern California on the San Andreas Fault, resources are going to be stretched in all across, and so we do need help. If I'm correct, I think you have <coughs> somewhere over 120 people that are certified in CERT. Correct. So we, if somebody was trained three years ago, is there any kind of refresher class? Uh, there, there isn't a refresher, <coughs> but what I've offered, I've had, uh, we've taught four classes since 2009. Um, in 2009, I graduated about 45 people from the class, and when I had, had another class in 2011, some of them contacted me and said, you know what, I, I don't remember a lot of what I learned because, again, if you don't use it, you don't you lose it. And so I offer to them that they can come and sit in the class, they have their own materials that they can follow the class, but they're not going to necessarily be actively participating, but they can go through the materials with the rest of the class. And so if anybody needs to do that, that is an option that is available. Thank you. And then also, that's where we have a quarterly training um, and meetings as part of the call-out team where it's not only maybe specialized training, but we may do refresher training. So we may have a fire extinguisher <coughs> pan exercise in uh, We haven't started that though, right? No. I'm in the final stages of finalizing it and getting everybody to do that. And so that's um, hopefully going to be done by the end of this year. Emergency preparedness, now how can you prepare it? Besides CERT, again, I'm gonna preach CERT and push CERT, and it, it's something that I wholeheartedly believe in. Uh, there's a few people in here that have gone through the CERT training. The windstorm, we graduated a CERT class two weeks before the windstorm. And so everybody here knows how the windstorm was devastating to the city. Uh, we were, our EOC was active for 72 hours. We had some of the volunteers that graduated from the CERT team two weeks prior that we called up and came in to assist us. And CERT does not have any age limits, physical limits. If you have someone that is elderly and maybe disabled, there's still a role for that person. You can have someone that is um, in great physical health, there's a role for that person. Um, we had a resident um, that came in, we had a couple of them that during the windstorm handed out water, handed out flashlights, handed out news release. They were someone that when the residents came in that they can talk to and discuss what was going on and be able to 
vent and kind of get some additional information. So there was no physical labor that was required and she was able, able to provide that service. We also had some people that were out there going door to door and knocking on the doors uh, off of Live Oak, contacting them, letting them know kind of updates that we got from Edison and see if they were okay, if they needed water or any services. And so there is a role for everybody. Earthquakes is gonna be the disaster that's gonna hit the city. Um, the windstorm was a freak thing that happened. Um, we're not gonna be hit by tsunamis. We're not gonna be hit by hurricanes. Uh, Temple City is not gonna be affected by a wild on fire. <laughs> Realistically, what's gonna happen in Temple City is we're gonna be affected by an earthquake. Uh, the San Andreas the southern section of the fall usually has an, uh, an earthquake on there every 150 years. Uh, we're going into, I think they said about 400 years since there's been an earthquake on there. And they're predicting, predicting about a 7.2 this larger magnitude and that's going to do some damage and it's going to be affecting the entire Southern California region. So if an earthquake happens, resources are going to cut off. The San Andreas Fault cuts off the 15 freeway and so resources from Nevada and other portions are going to be limited because everything's going to be gone. Uh, your infrastructure is going to be down. So uh, if you remember stuff with the North Earth earthquake or the Loma Prieta or Woody Narrows, th those are small compared to what's going to be on the San Andreas Fault. So what can you do to prepare and do during an earthquake? One is you want to identify and fix potential hazards in your home. And that's the same thing that the city does. We can look for hazards and we do what we can to mitigate them. Create a disaster preparedness plan. The city has an emergency operations plan. We need to do the same. That's basically having an out-of-state contact list. Identify the hazard in your home, evacuation point, meeting point, have stuff in place so that you don't have to think about what you're gonna do. You already have a plan that's gonna tell you and remind you what you need to do. Create a disaster supplies kit. You don't wanna have to wait for stuff to be available because when something happens, you know it's not gonna be available, or that $2 bottle of water may cost you $10. Um, identify and fix your building's potential weaknesses. And so, not only potential hazards that are around your house and just everyday stuff, but look at your facilities. If you're on a raised foundation, make sure that's inspected and looks good. Look, inspect your chimneys to make sure that they are reinforced or what you can do to retrofit them or create uh, a safer area because they will fall. If you have unreinforced masonry walls or anything, look at those to look what you can do to fix that and mitigate that situation. <coughs> um, you want to protect yourself during earthquakes and aftershocks. What do we do during an earthquake? Pray. <laughs> so if an earthquake were happening here, what would you guys do right now? Yeah. Oh. Drop, cover, and hold on. And so when you drop, you want to cover the back of your neck and make sure that you're getting as much of your head and neck under the table. If part of your back is sticking out, there's less nerves in, in your back than if you got hit in the head or in the back of your neck. After earthquake, check for injuries and damage. And then when safe, continue to follow your disaster preparedness plan. So a lot of stuff that's outlined here, if you think back to what the CERT curriculum is, is teaching you this stuff already. And so if you have no idea of where to start, I would recommend the CERT class. That, that again, I'm gonna keep pushing the CERT class because it is a program that I strongly believe in. Um, disaster supplies, um, you wanna have a kit at home, work or car. Can you predict where you're gonna be if a disaster hits? So you wanna make sure that you have something wherever you are that's gonna help you get through that situation. Uh, obviously at home, you're gonna have a more detailed kit at work, you may have a smaller bag because you're limited in where you can store things, and your car may be even smaller, but it could be women. If you're working and you're in a professional attire, you have a dress on and high heel shoes, are you going to be able to walk five miles in that dress and shoes? <laughs> so you may want to keep some tennis shoes and maybe some pants and change of clothes so that you're going to be more comfortable to being able to go over debris and around obstacles. And so those are some of the things that you consider at home. If you wear glasses, do you have glasses always with you? Or if your, your pair of brakes, do you have another extra set? And so even though your prescription may change, your previous glasses before your prescription change will be better than nothing. 
And so I'll take those glasses and maybe put those in a, a disaster kit, whether it's at home or at work, so that something happens, you have at least something so you're not impaired as bad as it would be if you didn't have anything. And so th those are some of the small things that you want to think about and make sure that you're doing what you can to protect yourself and make sure that you're going to get through the, the situation. And so one of the things that we're going to do here is uh, a group exercise. Um, in emergency management, we have different levels of exercises that we do from a full function, which just means everybody responds, we fully activate, the fire department comes out, the sheriff department, everybody's doing what they would do in a real situation, um, all the way down to a tabletop exercise. A tabletop exercise is we have a situation, we tell you the circumstances of that situation, and then you start discussing what those resources are and how you're gonna respond and, and just stuff like that. Over here to my left is a little game that we have. Um, again, CERT is one way that you learn information. I'll, I'll give you a quick emergency management rundown. Again, we follow the incident command system. We use the incident command system and we follow the SAMS and NIMS concept. One thing that we want to make sure that we have is someone's in charge. We can't have 10 people trying to say what they're going to do because everybody's going to want to do it their own way. So you do need someone in charge. When we do have a disaster, depending on the size of the disaster, we may or may not activate the EOC. We may or may not activate emergency shelter. If it is a larger disaster, such as a windstorm, the city council came in and they have a special meeting and they declared a state of emergency. Once that state of emergency is declared, that opens the city up to other resources from the county level, then to the state level, and possibly to the federal level if it's a large enough disaster. So with the windstorm, we declared a state of emergency and we were uh, received, we received some help from the county, the sheriff's department, the fire department, um, and it was declared as an emergency for the state of California. Unfortunately, it didn't reach the threshold for the federal declaration. And so some of the residents received some funding through the Small Business Association uh, for loans to fix up the house to supplement their insurance. Um, but if it receives higher levels of um, declarations, that just opens up more resources for the city and the community and the private sector as well. And so what we're going to do is divide the group up into two smaller groups. Um, we'll have the two that aren't at the table probably come with this group when they come up. You can stay there for now. Um, and we're going to come over here and I'll give you a quick rundown. So we'll start with this group. These, two, these tables here first, mm -hmm. and come on over to the table over here. is the hours that it's going to take to complete. So it may be from initial contact, a phone call, to being deployed and getting boots on the ground to have it completed. And so there's 14 tasks here. Within the group, you guys all have to decide what you're going to determine is going to be a priority, what what we need to do first, what um, the game plan is. The chart here, this represents each hour. So each column is one hour. And then as we're going along, this incident's gonna take, according to this, eight hours. Or it may go longer. And so what we're gonna start is, within the group, if you wanna decide uh, who your incident commander is, and that'll be your person in charge of controlling the, the ICS system. And as a group, the incident commander is gonna move forward and implement the group's decision. Well, so, experience, please do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lucy, you want to come on the other side? <laughs> <laughs> Brian in an emergency here in the city, so you just say emergency. Uh, uh -huh, yeah. It just all depends. The city manager is ultimately in charge of 
in city operations. But if the city manager is in Florida on vacation and he's not going to be back for a week, whoever gets here first, and that's where we train for success in training, so that if my director gets here, he can fill in for the city manager. Or if I get here and no one else is here, I have the basic understanding and, and can do it until someone else comes in that is better prepared or has more of the training to do it. If we don't have anybody available, we can ask other cities that may not be affected, uh, city of Rosemont City, you know what, we need an EOC manager to come down here because our city manager is away on vacation. And because of the training being standardized, we can share resources. And so what Lucy is going to do, as far as with the group, for the first hour, we're going to inspect four tasks. Question, windshield survey? We can talk about that in start, so. On the back, it tells you what, what it is. <laughs> right. And so we'll give you five hours. It's going to be about 15 minutes for this whole exercise. And th there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, obviously, there's always going to be things that you can do better. Something that, in hindsight, you say, you know what, I should have done it this way. And that's why we have mandatory after action reports to learn what we did and what they didn't do. Does it matter what the disaster is? Your disaster here is, as it says, the 2011 windstorm. And I selected that just because everybody has an understanding of what was going on. I don't have to tell you it was a three, um, 7.8 earthquake, city hall is destroyed. We have the disaster, we had a real life one that Live Oak was down between Baldwin to Cloverly because of the power lines. Half the city was out of power for seven days. Some areas we didn't have water for a few hours because the pumps were down because there was no power. Um, streets were blocked for a duration of time. There was 24-7 operations to recover. We had trees all over the place. We had physical damage to some of the facilities in the city. Private residences had trees in their roof protruding into the bedroom. And so you know what the scenario was. And so based on that windstorm event, no. For four, picking four, four, four of them, and you're going to talk the first four here. Okay. Well, did everybody get a chance to see? No. Why don't you read them off? Yeah. Okay. How is that the well, that, that's, it. that's done by electronic beam. As I mentioned in our presentation, we have a backup generator, so the city does have emergency power. Oris is the LA County EOC down in East LA. They have a backup generator, and so the exchange information can occur. Okay. So now in the second hour, we have the... All right, so we're going to recap real quick on the exercise. First group, was this a pretty easy exercise or was there a lot of decision making? There's a lot of unknowns. Um, you had the fortunate um, experience of having Lucy involved who's not through a cert class, so she had the basic understanding of the ICS system and knowing what the response levels should be. And so um, one of the things that Lucy said was you need people to do certain tasks. And so she made the decision and with the consensus of the group to activate CERT early on. Uh, it took some time to get them in here, but now you have additional resources. Um, activating a shelter uh, is not necessarily needed. Uh, the second group chose to call a city council meeting in the initial hour. Um, one of the things that I brought to their attention is, in order for you to call a council meeting, the council needs to have information and be able to make a decision off of that information. If you're just responding and you don't know what's exactly happening, um, the council's not going to have that information to make a sound decision and be able to make that determination. It, it may later on be a uh, response that ramps up and does become an emergency declaration, but in the initial response, we're still getting people coming in. So you want to manage your resources and get what you need there first. Um, CERT team, again, resources that are available. Uh, the second group also wanted to do a initial response to a windshield survey. And again, as I explained to them, that the windshield survey is great, but if you're coming in, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't have anybody to do that windshield survey. You don't have anybody in the city yet. And so you need people to do that. You need resources. 
if you have 10 people out doing windshield surveys, what are they going to do with that information? Are they going to just hold on to it and, and wait? You need the EOC to be able to manage that information so that it comes in. Uh, as I was explaining, I live in Fontana, so during the windstorm, I came in at 12.30. Uh, and I was here at 12.30 and the whole day the next day. Coming at 12.30, I didn't have an idea of the full magnitude of the disaster until probably 7 o'clock in the next morning when the sun actually came up and I could see what was going on. At first we thought, oh, just cut the power lines down here, there, turn the corner on Live Oak, see a little pole that's kind of toppled over. I'm like, oh, that doesn't look good. As I'm driving forward, my headlights light up and I see this tangled mess. And then trying to get around, going up around the trees, which every street was blocked. And so you don't know what's going on there in the initial response. And as soon as I saw that, I called the city manager, we were sending emails to the city council, calling my staff in, trying to get the, the situation under control. And then finally, when people were coming in for the regular shift, it's like, well, what happened? And that's when we were fully able to activate the UC. Council was informed, they came in. And this was eight hours after the incident occurred and so it doesn't have to be done right away and so you have to prioritize what you're looking at what your resources are what your availability as I explained to both groups um, if it's a larger regional disaster our resources within the area are going to be very thin, thin and limited and so we want to make sure that the county has that information so that if we need resources we can request it and get those resources quicker than other cities if the county doesn't have those resources it goes to the state and then it goes to the, the uh, FEMA to the federal level. So getting that information and getting that assessment it is key and paramount. So, But you also have to have somewhere that you want to manage it. So, and any questions as far as on, on a situation? And again, this is, there's a lot of that you can say what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, um, but you want to make the best decision with the information that you have and the training. I understand that you haven't gone through some of the ICS training and everything, but I think you guys did a good job for the information and circumstances that you guys have provided. So go ahead and give you guys a hand. <laughs> okay. uh, one of the other things I have up here is a uh, sign-up sheet for CERT. Uh, it's an interest list right now. We are going to be providing a CERT class on January 17th, 18th, and 19th. So we're doing a weekend class. The 17th will be uh, from like 6 to 10 p.m. Saturday would be from 8.30 to 4, and Sunday from 8.30 to 4. So if you're interested in attending that class, um, go ahead and put your name on here. Once I have the registration forms uh, ready, I'll go ahead and email that to you and get that turned back into me. But you guys will have a, a priority reservation to the class if you're interested in that. So that'll be up here. Um, some important information that we want to cover and make sure that you guys are on board with is this is the last session for the Citizens Academy, the seventh session. And so one of the things that we want to get from the group is an idea of what day works best for you uh, for a um, graduation reception and also a, a city council presentation. And a class photo. And a class photo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this will be done at a, we're in a day that the city council meets in January. So it's going to be either January 7th or the 21st. Uh, who's available on the 7th? <laughs> and who's on the 21st? <laughs> so keep these dates in mind. I'm not going to commit you guys to one day in particular, but within the next couple of days, if you guys could let Wendy know, email her, and let her know what date you're available for that. Um, it looked like more people were on the 7th, so it might be on the 7th. Um, but Wendy will confirm that if you guys just email her what your availability is. Uh, the other thing is, uh, your last session was a strategic planning uh, stakeholders meeting. On December 12th will be the strategic planning community meeting, so it's going to be for the general public to attend as well. Uh, you guys, again, being involved in it are invited to a, uh, attend to that. It's on Thursday, December 12th, from 7 to 9 p.m. at Memory Hall, so the same location that the first meeting was held at. Uh, and it will be, uh, at, again, at Longman School. And then after tonight, uh, Wendy will be sending an email to you reminding you of the upcoming meeting um, so that you have that information if you want to respond to that email and let her know what your availability is for the uh, graduation. 
Um, Wait, so she's going to email us first? We sure. Don't, okay. You can email her if you want, but she will be sending an email out just to remind everybody about the meeting next week. Okay. City manager? No, could you have the customer survey? Yeah, so we have the survey. Um, council member? Can we have the survey? Go ahead. You're going to hand out a survey? We have a survey that um, we want you to complete. Basically, uh, it's a survey about how the Citizens Academy is run, the sections, and the information. So that helps us prepare for the next Citizens Academy, what you guys like, what works best, and what we can improve on. How, how many here have, have attended a city council meeting? Let me ask, how many have not attended a city council meeting? <laughs> Good, you get a chance. That's part of the graduation ceremony is to, uh, is to get you to a city council meeting, at least see what the, see what the room looks like and how, how the meetings are held. I, I would really encourage you to come. I think it's important uh, to make that, that uh, graduation uh, time uh, the full councils there, obviously, they all didn't make it uh, to these sessions because of other commitments that they had. But I think it's important to see to see that. And I, I really want to thank you for, for attending. I mean, one of our, our goals uh, was to, to basically uh, build start building a farm team for people that can be in, in leadership positions here in the city. And so you need to know something about that to start with. So this is this is a first step of doing it. I mean, the, the steps beyond this, I mean, you can take the CERT training, you can, you can help in that area, which is very important. You, you can get involved in Neighborhood Watch. Uh, you, you can put your application in when there's openings for any of our commissions. We have a, a Public Arts Commission. We have a, a Parks and Recreation Commission. We have, a, I guess, the Transportation and the, Public Safety Commission, and we have a Planning Commission. So all told, there's 15, 20, there's 22 uh, commission positions that we have in the city here. Uh, so in addition to, to what goes on at the city council, I mean, there's things going on at these commissions. There are open meetings, just like the council meeting. They're in the council chambers. Uh, the schedule is out there. So I mean, I mean, you can sit in on some of these. You can go to a park and rec commission meeting and you know sometimes you'll sit there by yourself and you know you show up the commissions commissioners will say wow somebody came to hear us talk about something or you go to a planning commission meeting where there's a, there's a controversial project on where the, the rooms you know there's a fair number of people there that want to that, that want to be involved in it so I would encourage you uh, same with the council meetings if you can't make the council meetings you're aware that they're televised so you, you can watch you can watch live and see what's going on. If you can't do that, uh, the city's website has them, so you can pull them up after the fact. And uh, you know, you can watch us littler as much as you want. Uh, you can come to council meetings. Uh, a lot of people show up and do some ceremonial stuff. And, and uh, it's interesting when I walk into a, a council meeting and the place is full of people. You're saying, "Oh my gosh, is there really a controversial issue that I'm not aware of?" <laughs> Or are we, are we giving a lot of things? And you see a bunch of kids there, and you say, ah, oh, the kids are getting some certificates, so it's all the parents and, and grandparents are there. And as soon as we make the uh, presentation, the place clears out. And, and, and Jerry knows. Jerry, last meeting, Jerry, Jerry usually has a front row seat. He, he got there a little bit late, and the first three rows were taken, so uh, Jerry didn't get, didn't get the front row seat. And, uh, so. Well, anyhow, I, again, I, I thank you for participating in this. We feel this is part of a very important part of uh, you know, getting people involved in the city. We've got, we've got over 35,000 people here. <clears throat> if you think of the 22 commissioners and the five council members, that's 27 people out of 35,000 or 36,000. I mean, that's not very many. So it's important that we get other, other people involved showing up to meetings and you can show up to meetings even if you don't have an issue that you're concerned about just to see what's going on if there's an issue that you're interested in please show up please show up and, and, and speak and a lot of people are intimidated they say oh my gosh I, how do i get up and speak and just do it once i mean we're not we're not going to bite your head off or anything and uh, as a as a council member i appreciate getting input before we make decisions 
Most of the input I get is after we make decisions and they tell us how bad the decisions were. So, so please give us stuff ahead of time that helps making decisions. That's Speaking of that, when you ask for public comments in meetings and they fill out a form and then they, every time I've been there, so you're asking for public comment before they hear what's going to be said that night. Oh, it's okay. like, okay, I want to comment afterwards, after I've heard all the information that you guys hear, but I don't know enough about it to ask anything and make comments before I hear the information. Well, there's, there's, I guess two things that go on in the council meeting. One is there's a public comment period. So if you have whatever, I mean, you just have an issue with the city and you want to come and tell us about it, there's an opportunity. And that's what's in the beginning usually. It's a public comment time. So you can talk about anything. If it's one of the items on the agenda, when that item comes up, you can speak on the item. You have to fill out the little form and give it to whoever it is. Yeah, there's a little form that gets filled out. And the reason you do that is so the city clerk knows that somebody wants to talk about that issue. So if, if you watch the process, because usually that yellow note slipped over to the mayor who was running the meeting, and the mayor then knows, ah, okay, there's somebody that's going to speak. And if the mayor doesn't pick it up, the city clerk says, you know, Madam Mayor, you know, there's somebody here to speak on that issue. But you're supposed to fill that little form out before the meeting ever starts, so you don't know if you're going to make a comment or not until that you heard well, but we're, we're, we're pretty loose. I mean, if, okay. if, if you get, you know, if you want to speak, and you'll hear a lot of times, somebody get up, they start talking, Jerry will start talking, and, uh, you know, somebody say, Jerry, you got to fill out one of those yellows, but, you know, when you're done talking, fill it out and turn okay. it in. And that, that gives us the public record, because a lot of times people will speak, either they don't give their names, or you can't understand their name. So to, to, to get in the minutes and, and to have a record of who spoke, I mean, it, it helps to have you know, some, some information that we can go on. And then we provide a second uh, public comment time, which is right at the very end of the meeting. So if, you could, if you're gutsy enough to hang in there until 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, and you still want to say something, Jerry does sometimes. He one, in the, one in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, that's sort of a time you can get up at the end. I, I should probably let Jerry tell you about public comments. I mean, he's... <laughs> he, he's He's the kind of citizen you want. I mean, Jerry pays attention to what's going on, and, and I really appreciate it. I mean, he speaks. If he doesn't like what we're doing, he's going to tell us. If he likes what we're doing, he's going to tell us. And that's very, very helpful. And, and we want to hear both ways. I mean, you think you just want to hear the nice stuff, but you really don't. I mean, to, to make good decisions, you have to hear all perspectives. And uh, sometimes you don't want to hear it. Sometimes it sort of smarts when it comes at you. But I mean, you need that. So that's why we encourage you know to provide input. I mean, you can you can email us. I mean, some people do. There's an issue coming up, and we'll send emails to all the council members and say, you know, here's my input. You can send letters in. Uh, you know, you can contact city manager's office and you know whatever form it is to provide information to us. So. It's a fun process, it really is. I mean, city government is really neat, and this is our city. Uh, it becomes what we make it. And it uh, so thank you for coming to this class. Uh, this is a key part of being a good citizen. And uh, you, when we have the graduation ceremony, you will be the second class. So we now have about, about 50 people, somewhere around 50 people who will finish this class. And, uh, so if you take the, the 20, 22 commissioners plus five council, that's 27. So we've now doubled, so we've, we've added twice, twice, twice the number of people that pretty well at least been exposed to this type of stuff. So anybody have any questions? Okay, do we have the test that we're going to give them now? Yeah. See how well you listen to all Yeah, but <laughs> before you get a graduation certificate, yeah, we're going to give you a test. Of all seven sessions. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I want to publicly thank staff, city manager, and this is a lot of work to put this on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the first class was really, really a lot of work because everybody had to start scratching their head like, I mean, what do we, you know, what information should we provide? This class was, was I'd say, more fun because everybody did it once and they said, ah, you know, I, if I did this different, if I did that different, and, and there was a little more interaction uh, with this one than there was the first one. So um, so thank you very much. And anything else? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank you. 
everybody because I know that this takes a lot of time. Uh, your family, you know, can be both the time to be, you know, your time in public service, but I mean, you're realizing that it, you know we only have one employee per thousand. Men. So the task to be daunting is a real emergency. So we're really kind of I think this is mm -hmm. the first step, and we appreciate the effort. We look forward to continuing to working with you, and hopefully through cert classes or other you know, commission appointments uh, as they come up. We would really look forward to having you participate or volunteer in a number of other programs and activities that the city offers. So it is your city, and it really is the people that you need. Them. So all we can do is provide the platform. Uh, the rest is really up to you. But we do definitely thank you for taking the time. And it's, it's something that we love to do, and it's our passion. I think you see it from the presentations that you've seen. I think that's really what you want to do today. So you're also passionate because you're here. So uh, we look forward to getting you in your graduation certificate and looking forward to having you involved in the future. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, I, I think as, 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 if you picked up the different classes, I mean, there's some really neat stuff going on in the city right now. I mean, sometimes there's a lot of stuff going on in the city right now. So this is a very exciting time. If, if you want to follow progress of stuff, I'd say the next two or three years are going to be very interesting in how we lay out and where the city's going in the next 25 or 50 years. So this is the time. So thanks to staff, thanks, thanks to the city manager, everybody here. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.